Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of That's Wild Tales from the Human Side of Nature. I'm your host, Mike Scargeland, and welcome back to the That's Wild virtual campfire, around which people from all walks of life tell the stories of their experiences in and with nature. The tales told on That's Wild are very different from show to show, as I'm sure you know already, as are the people, but it's important to remember that they're all authentic, told by the very people who experience them. Now, before I introduce our guest tonight, the usual housekeeping. First of all, if you'd like to ask our storyteller a question at the end, just look out for the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You click that, type your question, send it off, and it could be selected to be asked during the Q&A session once the story has been told. The event is being recorded for use on YouTube and New Jersey Audubon's website, and the Zoom chat function has been disabled as usual. And don't forget, if you at home would like to submit a story to That's Wild, we've set up a submission page uh, on the New Jersey Audubon website. The web address for that is njaudubon.org forward slash that's hyphen wild. Tell us your story. You never know, you may get picked for a future episode. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our tale teller tonight. He is an avid enthusiast of all things wildlife with a particular passion for fishing and birding. With his brothers, he helped forge the New Jersey Young Birders Club in 2009 when he was just 11 years old. And he was a writer for the New Jersey Audubon website as well for two years. And after graduating Stockton University with a bachelor's degree in marine biology, he, de he devotes his time now, his free time, towards developing his YouTube channel, which is called Joe the Naturalist. It has vlogs and videos dedicated to educating the public on wildlife and natural history. His story tonight is called Nature's Artistic Educator. So please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome our storyteller tonight, Joe Hernandez. Alrighty. So, um... My story starts in um, fall of 2003. Um, we're in, in my new house cabin. We're kind of moving into this new house that's in Great Meadows from Jersey City. And my dad brings in a large, a large box, a large box that I've never seen before. And it's, it's huge. It's filled with a whole bunch of trinkets and everything. I was just dying to see what's in it. We're setting up something inside the cabin side of my house, which is much older than the original, the full-size body of the house. And I look inside and there's a whole bunch of artifacts, strange artifacts and everything from all sorts of different time periods that I've noticed. Some were like pottery and drums and musical instruments. And I don't know, those never really fancied me, especially when I, um, I was only five years old. But as I dug beyond the, the artifacts and everything, I found something that definitely pleased me more. And that was the artifacts of the past, of life from the past, prehistoric fossils. And that excited me so much as a child. And I was looking at various different shells that were in slate, different um, bones, fragments of dinosaur bones. And the thing that excited me the most was a full-size um, tooth of a, a megalodon, a megalodon, Carcharodon megalodon, which is a prehistoric shark that grew up to 60 feet long. And that excited me so much. Not, it may have just looked like an ordinary big slab of rock that was just sitting in my hands, but it was so much more to me because I had a knowledge that it was part of something so much greater. And that's what excited me. But at the same time, that wasn't really the most fun part of having that knowledge. The most fun part of having that knowledge was the moments after it. When I had this shark tooth in my hand, I ran around to my relatives and family that were helping me move in and saying, hey guys, look at this amazing shark tooth I found. And let me tell you all about it. And that was the beginnings of me realizing that knowledge is never meant to be kept. 
and stored in your brain, but to be shared with others in your own way. So, of course, looking at artifacts and um, museums was basically the only way I knew of nature at that time, since I just moved from Jersey City. Living in the concrete jungle was a very interesting experience. All that I knew of nature and science and the outdoors was found indoors, as a matter of fact. I was going to museums and looking at replicas of massive forests and fossils and organisms from far away lands that it may seem. I went to aquariums that had tons of different kinds of fish that I'd never seen before that were inside tanks that seemed very foreign. And then I went to libraries just looking at books of creatures and animals and nature. All that seemed like so much of a fantasy, but that was all going to change. And that was when I first made my trip to my favorite park still out of all the state parks that are in New Jersey, and that was Liberty State Park. I went to Liberty State Park as a child and I was floored, not by the Statue of Liberty or the sights of New York City, but the pure beauty of the pristine habitat, the habitats that were preserved within this park, the salt marshes, the rocks, the waters, the New York Harbor were filled with life. And I was going around every trail just looking for the next great thing of the form of wildlife, all these things that I saw in these books. And that was such a fantastic experience. It was like a fantasy. But the fantasy was only beginning. In 2003, I moved out west to Great Meadows, New Jersey, which is a foreign thing for somebody that was growing up in Jersey City. It was pure, it's called Great Meadows because it is almost completely farmland. And it was mostly farmland, but it's also part of the Ridge and Valley and the Highlands, um, which means that there was a lot of hills, there's a lot of mountains, and it was truly fantastic. As soon as I moved in, I looked over the view beyond my house and all I can see were hills upon hills of trees and forests and gorges. And I was completely overwhelmed. I had no idea what I was getting into. This was the great beginning of a passion for the outdoors, not in a book, not in a museum, not in an aquarium, but right at my fingertips. My backyard was acres upon acres of woodlands. Some of it not being my property, but that never really stopped me. <laughs> and I went beyond the borders many times in my explorations. But every weekend, my family would go out to a new park and try and find something, a new place, a new treasure that was within this kind of hidden gem of New Jersey. And between those wonderful excursions, I started my public schooling. I had two brothers that were with me when I moved, uh, my younger brother, Silas, and my older brother, Nathaniel. And we uh, went to a public school that was just down the road. And I just, I was very bored in my classes. All I wanted to do was go out and explore the wilderness. I was constantly distracted, always drawing the great creatures that I remembered from my field. And I was just amazed and always distracted. And the same thing came up on every report card that this kid has so much potential, but his head is always in the clouds. And honestly, I think that description still fits me to this day because I'm always thinking about my next great adventure into the woodlands. Um, so eventually the effects of that came to my grades and it, they were at stake and I, my family realized that and my parents decided to take the education into their hands and they became my teachers. I started homeschooling um, and that was a complete world flip. I was about to experience the, my area like never before. I thought that moving in was just the beginning. Home, when I went to homeschooling, that was the great beginning of my explorations. 
um, my curriculum was completely geared towards my exploration of the this thing I was so passionate about the the natural world and my parents recognized that and wanted me to excel in that and the way they um, made me excel the most was by giving me and each of my brothers a completely blank notebook and said you're going to do nature journaling and every day you're going to draw something and write something that you learned about something you did saw in the field in your backyard or on a hike that we do. And I did that every day and I, I loved it. I drew so many different kinds of animals I saw, so many different kinds of plants and rocks that I found, lichens and fungi. It was a grand experience. And I loved it so much that I did it even not for my assignments. I did it just for fun. And I grew beyond and I realized I want to do something big about this. I want to make something happen. And in 2008, I decided to take inspiration from the hundreds of Ranger Rick magazines that I got in my mail. And I wanted to make my own magazine and design something. My parents at the time were graphic designers and I saw what they did all the time on the computer. And I want to do that all on paper. And I decided to make my own magazine and I titled it Wild Magazine. And I did basically what I did in my nature journaling. I find a creature that I really loved and I drew it and I wrote some facts about it. And that was just my magazine and I filled it with that. And it was such a grand experience of just drawing all these creatures and writing facts from all the encyclopedias I had. It was fun. And Eventually, some of my family members realized that this was something that I was doing, and they were looking at it, and they're like, hey, you want to send this to me or email this to me and send a copy of it? I was like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll send you it. And eventually, I had up to 20 subscribers of this wild magazine that seemed so humble, and it lasted for about four years, I think. And... It developed, my writing got significantly better. My drawing got a lot better as well. It was a skills that were developing, but my subscriptions kind of felt like it was limited and I wanted to go beyond that. I knew that I wanted to make something bigger. And eventually the opportunity rose and it came in the form of me coming back from doing some bluebird monitoring at one of my favorite locations uh, Water, Waddle Stewardship Center uh, place run by New Jersey Audubon Society. And I remember coming back and I uh, had a meeting with Dale Rosslett, the head of education at the organization. And she asked me if I can take my writing and do it on the website and do some columns. And, and I was like, sure. I, I never thought that my writing would get as far as this since I was literally just writing on these pages for this wild magazine. And I was so little and I thought, this, this is, what am I, what am I doing? This is just simple writing and now it's gone to this? So I started writing about phenology, which is the study of seasonal changes in wildlife. And it's still something I'm really passionate about. I did that for two years, and eventually after those two years were up, I decided to write my own blog, which I continued to fill with my adventures of, in wildlife and highlighting local species that I encountered. It was a really, really cool experience, and I did that starting in 2013, and I ended around 2016. Um, when I started looking at colleges, it was a stressful time. It was no, no doubt. I was looking at different colleges in different areas near and far. And I really didn't, I did not exactly know what I wanted to do with myself. I knew I was passionate for sciences and the natural world, especially the marine sciences, but I didn't know what I wanted to do after with that. So eventually I settled with the closest answer and the cheapest answer, which happened to be Stockton University. And it was now that I was settled in that, I knew that 
I wanted to go one step further before I went off to my college career. And once again, the opportunity rose out of nowhere for a new step in my creative walk. And that came in the form of a contest. Conserve Wildlife of New Jersey has a contest that they do called the Species on the Edge Contest. And I applied to it in the past and did the contest for the art and essay version, which I did when I was little. And they had something for um, high school students as far as doing digital art. And I wanted to apply to that. I knew that my blogging days were kind of coming to an end. So I decided not to do that. And I wanted to go towards something new and different. So I started looking at what I did in the past. Now, outside of my life of doing nature and stuff, I did really ridiculous home videos. And those involved doing like different little putting together home videos of action and comedy. And I did that with my friends. And that was just something I casually did on the side. And I enjoyed it. And it definitely developed my skills of video making as humble as, that, as it was, just slapping some videos together from my point and shoot camera um, and putting it on Windows Movie Maker. It was really simple and it was really basic, but I knew I had some skill in that. So I was like, I think this is time for me to take my love of nature and my knowledge of writing for nature and combine that with this growing knowledge of video making. And me and my younger brother got together and made my first video for my YouTube channel. Um, when I was thinking about what I was gonna do it on, I was thinking uh, maybe I should do birds. I really like birds. But I didn't really have a good camera for birds. And then I thought, what about fish? I love fish. Those, that's my second favorite thing at the time. But I didn't have an underwater camera. So I was losing options. And I was thinking, what am I going to do this video on that I love so much? And then I decided to go with something that was very unconventional that I never really talked about before. And that was amphibians. Um, and I focused a video on amphibians and how they rely on vernal pools. And once I started filming it, I had the most fun I've ever had with a project. It was truly remarkable. Just taking all these different facets of my knowledge of the arts beforehand, of whether it be composure of a shot with drawing and photography that I did beforehand, or writing to help me develop the script and eventually directing it in the end and producing it. I felt like every aspect of my creative walk just combined to this final frontier of video making. And I eventually finished the video and um, it was called The Secrets of Vernal Pools. It was about seven minutes long, a very humble amount of time. And with my point and shoot camera, it was not the best quality of video, but I did get to showcase some of my photography, photography and um, amphibians I found in different vernal pools in my backyard and other places. And I submitted it, not expecting much. I got a letter back and I found out I got first place in the contest and I was truly amazed. And eventually the video kind of went viral on their YouTube channel. channel and. I found out so many people had watched this video that I was going to different places and they kind of recognized me. And I was like, I, what, what did I do? What, what really, how do you recognize me? And they said, you're Joe the Naturalist. Now, Joe the Naturalist was never a term that I really brought up when, in my videos beforehand or my writing and any work I did. It was just simply, they knew that I was passionate about nature and I was such an enthusiast about it that they just coined me Joe the Naturalist. And that was something that I just kept and just kept flowing with the rest of my work that I did from then on in 2016. And then my four years of college began. And that was a big, very big lull in my creative life. I was trying to figure out and navigate what I wanted to do as far as a career. and. 
I was thinking, and it was probably around sophomore year that this kind of sparked in my mind, that every step of the walk that I did as far as this art, I was trying to do it to share something, to share the knowledge that I had and I was developing from my time in the field. And maybe that was, that was the final thing that I needed. That was the thing that I needed to do because so many people didn't know about the wonders of nature that are in New Jersey that I needed to share this knowledge. I was tasked with this. This is my purpose. And immediately I started curving my classes to work with the topic of environmental education. And that's where it began. I, I started taking classes for photography so that I could develop my skills with um, video making. I, uh, took cl several classes for writing so that I can improve my script writing. And first and foremost, I took many, many classes about zoology and the sciences that broadened my knowledge of the natural world even more than it was before. And it was truly incredible experience. And as soon as I graduated, I knew that I needed to get back into the flow that I had beforehand. And it was time to start making videos again and that's when i really set up my youtube channel and i started filming i did videos practically every almost every week after i graduated and it was an amazing experience and many times when i posted one i was like man this was this wasn't that good i really did not try hard and i didn't really work well on it and i felt discouraged that it was not going to be received well but then I realized that every creation that I made had a purpose to develop me in my future content. And that looking back on what I remembered and the steps that I took in my creative walk to get to where I, I was at that point and where I am, were just from like simple steps, simple and some of them being ridiculous from my little wild magazines that I drew on paper to my nature journals, to my ridiculous home videos that didn't seem like they served a purpose, but in a sense, they developed me to be with who I was. Each one had a purpose. And I often compare that to the sense of the world and this planet as an ecosystem, because just like all creatures, great and small, have been designed each for their role on this planet, I believe that every effort that we strive, whether it seems like a failure or success, has a role in a bigger, bigger picture of our lives. And that is something I live by on the daily as I develop this YouTube channel and my further um, career so that I can bring my knowledge to others to know how great this world is and how amazing particularly New Jersey is for its wildlife and its natural world that it is in. And that's all. Well, Joe, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What a great story. Um, I, the first thing I wanna say is, your parents sound very, very cool. <laughs> they are, they're no doubt the coolest parents I can ever imagine having. <laughs> I wish my parents had been a little, little bit more like your parents somehow, but uh, <laughs> love my parents, but you know. Um, listen, I got a bunch of questions for you. Um, so, what a what a what a fantastic journey you've been on. And you know, speaking as somebody who's not particularly young anymore, it's so it's so wonderful to hear you know somebody who is still young and has still got so much uh, drive and passion, and it's just a, a a great thing. So, the first thing I wanted to ask you is. You've created in video, in art, uh, photography. You mentioned and and illustration I, I i suppose or drawing what do you think your favorite medium is and why um it's it's hard to say because like there's a lot of different mediums that i do on the daily and i i'm man, i do drawing all the time i just do a lot of sketches i do a lot of video making i do a lot of photography but i think honestly i think simply photography is probably my favorite out of them all just because I could do it so casually and 
it has so much of an effect on a person as far as seeing something from especially because most of my photography comes from local wildlife i don't i never really travel that far i've only gone to nicaragua and that's the only time i've been out of the country and that was a grand experience but i think most of my great ex experiences in wildlife were actually here in new jersey and i share that with everybody through my photography and i think that that is my favorite medium to use even more than uh, videography in a sense yes but since i could do it more often many times i feel like like setting up a whole video could be in a sense a chore but and i i love vi doing video but photography is something that i've grown a big passion for as a consistent art that i've done but i definitely say videography is probably a close second if not on the same level as far as it just because it's i it's so much fun just like to move about and be able to teach somebody like they're right there, like they're the camera and be able to show like the uh, knowledge that I have in front of me and show that to people. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience. Susan wants to know, do you, have you got a favorite wildlife encounter that you've experienced in your, in your life? <sighs> That's so hard a favorite wildlife encounter. There have been so many encounters. Um, I think there was, I'm gonna go to probably my first, like my first favorite that I can think of that was really on that, really early on when I was probably around, I don't know, 13. And that was, um, I, I was, I think it was the first time I, exp I read like, I walked into my woods as far into the woods as I possibly went at that time. And I reached a new record of distance and I encountered this massive gorge and a stream. It was like huge. It was very, very deep and there was waterfalls and everything. And this is something that I never thought could be in my vast backyard. And I remember sliding down deep into the gorge and just landing towards the, like, the stream. And I, I like just got close to like looking around trees and then eventually I just st it, like stopped and I was startled because there was a large garter snake that was just sitting on the side of the stream. <laughs> and I looked closer and there was a full size, probably way bigger than its mouth, a wood frog that was, he was swallowing and busy swallowing as well. And I was, I was just, I thought, this is fascinating. Like I was just so amazed by just seeing this creature, just not mind me just standing there and sna snapping pics of this just casual garter snake. And I think that was one of my greatest experiences, just that I can like be a part of something and like the animal not minding me, just joining in that fellowship of action and just seeing as, as much as I pity the wood frog that he was eating. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. it was a really cool experience there are so many experiences i had up in that woods that i could probably go on for hours about <laughs> so talking about the woods and, and wild habitat what do you think the future holds for new jersey's wild habitats with everything that's going on with you know climate change and so on honestly it's hard to say i, I think it's really hard to say but I am a very optimistic person when it comes to that. And I've seen incredible movements as far as bringing education and the knowledge of the sciences and the real problems of our world and conservation to all sorts of groups of people around the state, including into our inner, inner cities. And I think that that's really inspired me to think that New Jersey has such a great chance to improve. And I think even like with developing parks and places in such a, as called as the armpit of America, I think <laughs> it's, it's incredible to think that this state is such a beautiful, bountiful place that is such a developing like um, uh, organizations and groups that are so willing to advance conservation and environmental education and stewardship for the yeah. state. 
So okay. I'm very positive with how New Jersey's going and the future of our world in a sense. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, well said. Um, Christian in the audience would like to know who in your life has inspired you the most in your love for nature? Huh. It's hard to say as well, because there's been a lot of people that I've encountered as, as just that have developed me as a person into my like field of environmental education and just passion for nature. I mean, it's kind of obvious that my parents were a really big part of it just because they've developed me and to who I was. My dad, I forgot to mention this, but he got, I don't, I don't think I mentioned it in the story, but he got all those little trinkets from his jobs at the American Museum of Natural History and the um, Staten Island Children's Museum. And as much as my parents were not, uh, were not scientists, they were artists, they were very, they were always inspiring me to continually pursue what I was passionate about and what the knowledge that I had in my brain had a purpose. Um, I always say that my brothers were always also great inspiration as well. Um, they're possibly one of the reasons that I'm still in the environmental field and did a lot of what I've done now. I mean, I can't, I don't think I could have done my videos without my younger brother, who was always there for me when I was just filming stuff. And then Nathaniel was also really awesome and helping, like, as uh, you mentioned earlier, how I developed the Young Birders Club, which from early stages was just a simple 4-H club. And then we kind of took ownership of it when that 4-H kind of let it sit in the dust. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just my family, I'd say, is probably the biggest inspiration for my walk in nature. Right. Um, it's been a lot, obviously, written and spoken about the planet that we live on, uh, that our current crop of world leaders may be leaving to the rising generation, i.e. you guys. As a member of that rising generation, what are the issues that you're most focused on and concerned about? Um, I definitely say just there's like a sense of ignorance that I've noticed in the world, especially when it comes to just casually like talking with people that are not really interested in the environmental field that just they don't know. I think many times we like often accuse people of like not like being smart about their like sense of conservation and stewardship of the environment but I think we have to recognize that some of them just don't have an idea of what's going on like they don't know what is going on in this world and I think the ignorance is the biggest problem and education is the biggest solution for that. And that's why I really thought that becoming an educator in the environmental field was so essential for me as a person, because I found the gift that I was able to share this knowledge and take something so, that seems so complex and sciencey and bring that to a simple message to people. And I think that's a massive impact. That's a huge impact because once they learn this stuff, they will make an impact as well. They'll tell others, they'll bring that into their daily lives like once they know about it they start changing their lifestyle and that really changes people and makes an impact so that's that's my answer to that so well talking of that and your videos and education um we have another question from the audience which is what would you recommend out of the uh, out of your collected works as it were for people to look at first i mean what's the what's the top YouTube episode that you would recommend people, um, if they've not seen your work before, um, become introduced to Joe the Naturalist? Um, well, I've done a lot of videos from now on, but I, I'm trying to think of one that I made the least amount of mess ups in the process <laughs> of creating it. And I mean, there's never gonna be a perfect video. And I always recognize that there's never a perfect work, but I'd say, one of my favorites to make was by far uh, my video that is titled Life on the Rocks. It was my second adventure video that I made that was very vlogging style. 
Right. And I filmed it with my brother at Barnegat Lighthouse. And that is probably one of my favorite birding spots in all of New Jersey. And once I, I was able to incorporate so many different aspects of the place and so many aspects of my surroundings and different ideas that I felt really proud of how it came out. And I think I, if anybody wants to watch like their first video on my channel, I'd say it'd be Life on the Rocks as much as I do really enjoy how the others came out as well. Well, you heard the man, folks. Check it out. Life on the Rocks. <laughs> um, what's on your travel bucket list? Where, where do you want? You mentioned Nicaragua. Where, where else would you want to go in the world? Like if you if somebody said, OK, here's whatever it takes to get somewhere and you were allowed to go on a plane, which, of course, we can't these days. But where would you go? So ever since I was young and you heard my very big fan of sharks and stuff when I found that Carcardon Megalodon tooth, I've, I've had a great appreciation and love for the most ugliest and deadliest animals. <laughs> I think, and there's only one place that you really get most of that and that's Australia. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I think Australia would be my next stop as far as like, a, like, a list of places that I've been. I've, I would love to go to Costa Rica as well, but I feel like I experienced a lot when I went to Nicaragua, which is very close, and I want something very different and very extreme, and I think Australia would be the <laughs> next greatest place to go as far as places. And I, I, there's so many cool habitats and different forms of wildlife there, whether it be dangerous or completely harmless. I think that's just, there's so many cool things over there in the ocean and on land that's just so unique, and I I got to get over there sometime. Okay, so you and I have to talk offline because I lived in Australia for five years. So I've got some places for you to go. And there's somebody in the audience actually who's who's recommending that you dive the blue hole in Australia. Oh, so, I forgot about that place. Yeah, so there's there's it is an amazing place. But anyway, I digress. But we, we should talk about that for <laughs> in the future. Um, so you mentioned you, you mentioned you obviously have a degree in marine biology. Is that something you're pursuing now are you doing marine biology now or are you doing something else in a sense i kind of am so right now i am currently in the watershed ambassador program which is um a large-scale program that is run by the department of environmental protection and uh, americorps and i as a watershed ambassador am representing the upper delaware region which means i am promoting stewardship and doing education programs through the resources that I have and provided by like my host agency, which is the Muscat Kong Watershed Association. And I do education programs, I do habitat restoration, I do water monitoring through doing um, macroinvertebrate studies and habitat analysis of different streams that are in my area, which is mainly just Sussex and Warren County. And I'd say a lot of that knowledge comes from my experience in marine biology. I think um, my degree really helped me in a sense with giving me that broad um, knowledge of how like water science is and aquatic life. I wouldn't say it perfectly prepared me for freshwater science because I really, it was marine biology for a reason, it's ocean life. But now I'm here in the middle of inland and learning about freshwater but a lot of it still applies and I think I'm kind of quite prepared for this experience and I think that's and that's where I'm really at now. So Susan wants to know actually on that subject what was your favorite class at Stockton? Uh, well I, that's an obvious choice. I have to go with ichthyology which is the study of fishes. I, I that was a class that I had so many different field experiences of doing um, doing different seining, which is seine netting, different um, studies of um, freshwater and saltwater species, and really learning about the details of uh, like the anatomy and biology of fishes, which are my one of my favorite groups of animals. And it involves so much time out in the field that it just felt like every class was just an outdoor experience. The, of me being out on the water, catching new species that I've never seen. And that was just so much fun. I'd say that was like probably my favorite experience at Stockton. Yeah, it sounds great. 
So I have one more question for you, Joe, um, before we close. Where do you see yourself in about five, 10 years? What's the future hold for Joe the naturalist? Well, I'm hoping that I do eventually get more consistent with my video making. I know that right now I've been working on a lot of projects with the Watershed Ambassador Program and it's been a truly a great time, but I've been very, very busy. And I'm hoping to keep a consistency of making more videos, but I'm also hoping that my experience leads up to a further career in environmental education. I really would like to help develop programs and um, events and things, especially like especially for youth that I'm really, really interested in, like and help direct something. And that I don't I don't really care where I'm at. I really I would love to be at the coastline. I really I don't it doesn't matter if I'm inland either. Um, and it's just that's something I really want wherever I'm at. I want to teach people. I want to continue doing that and it's something that I've done a lot of my life and I just don't want to stop and I think that's that's really where I want to go well, that's terrific well sadly we're out of time Joe and um, I want to thank you so very much for sharing your story on that's wild tales from the human side of nature tonight as I, as I mentioned before it's truly inspirational to hear such passion and creativity um, and we all of us wish you the best for your endeavors um, over the next few years and beyond. And it's really good to know. I have to say, it's really good to know that our future, our collective future has people like you in it. So thank you. Um, and I also want to give a quick shout out to Kelly and Lillian uh, for making tonight and indeed all the That's Wilds uh, happen. Um, they're, they're the team behind the scenes and they're making it all work. So thank you guys very much indeed. So everybody um good night thank you again for attending this um that's wild we'll see you next time and in the meantime stay well and stay wild and thanks again joe thank you